This is a Reconstructionist Radio production. For more audiobooks and other content, please visit reconstructionistradio.com. Book title, Church Shift. Author, Sunday at Elijah. Published by Charisma House. Copyright, 2008. Narrated by Jason Garwood. Chapter 7. Go to the least of these. One of the hardest lessons I ever learned about ruling my promised land is that God usually starts at the bottom of society, not the top. He loves to serve the least of these, Matthew 25, 40, not the leaders. When Christ was born, the angels went to shepherds, not Caesar. Jesus ministered to the poor, not the well-fed. If you really want to build the kingdom of God, start by serving the people who are considered the least important and least valuable around you. When I completed my journalistic studies in Belarus, communism was just crumbling, and I and other Christians had begun taking the gospel message to the streets more boldly. It was an exciting time of new freedoms, but the old powers had not lost their sting. Because of my religious activities, the government asked me to leave Belarus. I resisted strongly in prayer, but God said to me clearly and distinctly, Leave Belarus. I protested, No, Lord, this is my promised land. I cannot leave. I had sown my life there for seven years. Now it appeared that God wanted to send me back to Africa. Finally, I gave up the fight. I decided that if the Lord wanted to use me in Africa, that was his decision. I was heartbroken, but obedient. But God didn't want to send me to Africa after all. Rather, he opened a new door for me to come to Ukraine. I got a call from a television station in Kiev that needed a journalist who spoke Russian. My fiancé, Bose, a Nigerian student whom I had met in Russia, agreed to join me there. I started my journalism career in Kiev, helping to produce and script shows for this pioneering television station. I was having much early success, but after only a year in Kiev, I felt God nudging me to begin another church. I didn't want to go down that road again. Every time I started a work, God called me away from it. For three months, I wrestled with God. Every time I prayed, I heard these words, You have to start a church. At last, I asked him, Why do I need to start a church? Why is it so essential? Then God told me something that set the foundation for my life ever since. He said, Here in Ukraine, I want to raise up strong, large churches with many thousands of members for the purpose of spreading the gospel throughout the whole world. In the same way the Soviet Union planted communism around the world, so I will use the nations of the former Soviet Union to take the good news everywhere. I was dumbfounded because the largest church in Ukraine at that time had only 700 people. But the Lord kept impressing on my heart that he wanted me to train reaper warriors to bring in the final harvest, especially in China and the nations of the Arab world. His glory would come to the land of Ukraine as he used the nation to help gather in the final harvest. He said I hadn't even started my ministry yet. This time, he would not take me away from my church, as he did earlier. This church would be my home base for the ministry he called me for. I had arrived in my promised land. This was what the Lord had been preparing me for. I felt certain that the destinies of many people depended on how I would respond to God. I did not quit my journalism job at first, but I knew it was no longer my calling. Journalists always spread bad news. I was now called to spread the good news. My mind turned to the strategy I might use to accomplish the goal God had set before me of building a large church in Europe. I was only in my mid-twenties, but I made an announcement on television that anyone who wanted to study the Bible could come to my house, and I gave the address. I was hoping to attract professors and students from the local university. I envisioned having a church full of rich and powerful people who would get saved and do great things for God. I was disappointed when one of the first people to arrive was Natasha, an alcoholic. She was captivated by the message of the gospel, though at first she understood little of it. She simply felt joy being with us. The handful of others who showed up the first time were also simple people with alcohol and drug problems. They looked old and dejected. This happened again the next week and the next. Nobody came but a handful of derelicts. I redoubled my efforts and stood on street corners handing out invitations to normal people. 
It was strange for a black man to stand on the street corner inviting people to church. Nobody responded. I became more and more disillusioned. I didn't even know what to do with the few down and outers who came to services. Finally, I went home and prayed, God, you told me I would build a megachurch for you. Why is nobody coming? I decided not to sleep that night until I had an answer. At 3 a.m., God led me to Mark chapter 12, verse 37, which says that, quote, the common people heard him gladly, end quote. That sentence pierced my heart like a burning shaft. I realized God had sent his friends to me, and I was turning up my nose at them. God began to minister to me and said, Many people think that serving me means preaching from the pulpit. That is not my understanding of ministry. Preaching and church ministries are just tools and instruments you can use. But ministry is really about touching people. Get rid of your tie and jacket. Go out of your pulpit. Ministry is not about putting on your suit and handing out invitations and advertisements and expecting people to come hear you at church. Who are you, especially in this society? You are expecting people to go out of their way to come listen to you. They will never do it. If you were one of them, you wouldn't cross the street to listen to a Nigerian pastor either. How do you expect them to do that? You're not playing basketball or something else they want to see. And you want them to let you teach them how to live right? Yes, there is prejudice in this society, but that's not the only problem. You are part of the problem. Your understanding of church ministry is faulty. I was weeping. God's message to me continued, Take those ideas of ministry out of your mind. If you want to serve me, be like me. The ordinary people, the outcasts, the poor, the down and out, the drunkards all felt welcomed by me. That's why I said I was naked and nobody clothed me. That is ministry to me. If you can take care of them, you will take care of me. If you love them like I love them, you will love me. If I can trust you with them, then in the years to come, I will also be able to trust you with ordinary people and the elite, powerful, strong, and wealthy. But if I can't trust you with the naked and hungry, I won't be able to trust you with anybody. My mind changed that night. All my life I had thought, if I could only preach well and be eloquent and anointed, I would fulfill God's will. But God's revelation blew apart my conception of ministry. I saw that if I could make ordinary people feel good around me, I'd be like Jesus. I decided then to become trustworthy with the down and outers, the outcasts, the unlovables, and the untouchables. Breakthrough People asked me where my breakthrough in ministry started. It wasn't in learning and absorbing the Russian culture and language, though this gave me invaluable tools. It wasn't learning how to preach or feel comfortable ministering before a group. No. My breakthrough came when I left the pulpit and went to the streets to look for the outcasts. Truthfully, I never even knew such people lived in Kiev in any substantial numbers. I had always kept myself with university students and other so-called ordinary people. I didn't know there was a whole world of drunkards, drug addicts, and forgotten people living in the shadows of society. But when I reached out to them, doors opened up wide for ministry. Someone in our church knew of a hospital where drunkards were kept, so I began to go there and beg the doctors to give me one hour to be with the patients. I would bring along Natasha, who testified how she was delivered from alcoholism, and then I prayed for the patients. There my ministry began. God began to honor that sacrifice with supernatural anointing. When I prayed for drunkards and addicts, they would suddenly wake up from their stupor. The power of God would descend on them so strongly that they would be set free in an instant. As a result, they began to come to church. Then their mothers would come asking, What did you do to my son? We spent everything to try and help him. We don't care if you're red, white, or black. You've given us back our son. In one year, the church grew to a thousand people, and it added a thousand people every year after that. We changed meeting places six times in one year, going from east to west to south to north of the city. But it didn't matter anymore. I knew I had the key. If I could love people with this love, I could change the world. In the third year of our existence, the outcasts began to look respectable. They were getting jobs and homes, and nobody could tell they had been drunkards and drug addicts before. People thought they were normal, and so normal people started coming to our church too. 
Wealthy people joined us, as did the influential and the politicians. Many of them would invite friends without mentioning that I was a black pastor because people wouldn't come if they knew in advance I was from Nigeria. In that society, I was a monkey, a chocolate, even a chocolate bunny. But when people came and felt the Spirit of God, they looked past their prejudices, braved the rejection of their families, and made the kingdom their priority. In my first four years in Russia, I could not get any Europeans saved, but now thousands were coming because our church was touching ordinary people. To this day, serving the least of these is the primary concern of our church. It is our foundation. Is it yours? Take a moment to think, who are the least of these in your world? The janitors, gardeners, service people, cafeteria workers, secretaries around you. Jesus surrounds us in the form of other people. To reach new heights in the kingdom, we must extend our hand to the depths and become a friend of the unwanted and unloved. There, God will begin to transform our character. If God can touch the down and outs of society through us, only then will he trust us with the rich and elite of our nation. That is exactly what happened in Ukraine. God did what he promised, and now people think that we are a church of the rich and powerful. Various business people are attracted to the church. We've formed Club 1000, where we expect to have 1,000 millionaires. So far, over 500 people have registered to be part of the club. Now we have dozens of members in Parliament on different levels in our church. We have Parliament members on regional, city, and state levels. In the city of Kiev, the mayor is a member of our church. The Supreme Court Chief Justice is a member of our church. Also, the church party controls 20% of the city parliament. That is the faithfulness of God. If God cannot trust you with the least, he cannot trust you with the greats of the society. We are no longer known as the church of the down and out. Kingdom Principles from Chapter 7 Number 1. The destinies of many people depend on how you respond to God. Number 2. God loves to serve those who are considered least in a society. Number three, preaching and church ministries are just tools and instruments you can use, but ministry is really about touching people. Number four, God won't entrust you with the greatest until he can trust you with the least. Number five, my breakthrough came when I left the pulpit and went to the streets to look for the outcasts. Number six, If you can love people with God's love, then you can change the world. Number seven, to reach new heights in the kingdom, you must extend your hand to the depths and become a friend of the unwanted and unloved.